dear friends, we have a lot to talk about this month. I read so many good books. I read nine, two of those were audiobooks, and I did not DNF any books this month and really, really enjoyed every single one that I read and listened to. So this was a great reading month and it's kind of crazy to me though because when I think about May, like I feel like it went by so quickly, but when I was going through and, you know, grabbing all my books off the shelf that I need to talk about today, the first two, I was like, I feel like I read those so long ago. Count wise, this wasn't even my best reading month, but it felt like those books were so long ago. Like I filmed a reading vlog for the first two of them, three of them. And it, that video feels like that was so long ago. So I don't really know what's going on, but all I know is that I'm excited to talk about these books. First one we're gonna talk about is Swamplandia by Karen Russell. Um, I think that I want to give this a four, maybe a 4.25. Um, I am kind of in between on that. This book was so different from anything that I have read recently. And this family is just so odd and so interesting. Basically, the concept of this book is we have a gator wrestling theme park called Swamplandia that is actually on an island in Florida. So you have to like get on a ferry to get there. You don't have like they don't have any neighbors. They on their little island that they live on, they're the only ones. Our main character that this book centers around is Ava Big Tree. Their last names are Big Tree. And they she's 13 years old and everything in her life is basically going wrong. Um, her mother has most recently passed away because she got sick and her mother was the main wrestler, main attraction at this theme park. People didn't realize it. These tourists, they would come and be like, where's, you know, where's your mom? Like, why isn't she performing? Attendance drops. They're basically about to have to shut down because they just don't have any tourism coming in anymore. And so her dad leaves on a business trip to go get more money for them. So he leaves his three children alone on this island at their house. And her sister, her sister was stressing me out so bad this entire time. The sister is falling in love with a character that is so hard to explain that I honestly don't really want to explain because he's... It, like it's a plot point that I don't think I should spoil but they refer to him as the dredgeman and he is very creepy and elusive and so her older sister falls in love with this person and disappears she goes off to be with him and she's gone and then her brother Kiwi is has it in his head that he is going to save the family that he is going to save their home and not let it get foreclosed on so he actually goes to the mainland and he starts working at their rival theme park that just opened that is literally a theme park about the um, Dante's Inferno. Like, and I'm not even joking. Like, it is genuinely a theme park that these people are going to that is just the, um, the, the it's just Dante's Inferno. There's like the levels of hell and they have to call them wandering souls. It's so weird, it's so weird. And so he goes to go work there and he is going through his own struggle. He's realizing that he doesn't know how to be what people consider normal. Like everyone thinks that he is so weird because he, and it's not necessarily like the social interaction. He just doesn't know the things that other people know. Like they don't really have internet. They have like a really old TV. So like culturally he just doesn't, act the same and he doesn't know what anyone is talking about and that was a very interesting storyline and in the middle of all of this Ava is left by herself on uh, at their home and so she decides to go on an adventure with I'm not even with with a very interesting character go on an adventure to rescue her sister. It's just so hard to describe this book without giving anything away, but I will say that um, Stephen King had a pull quote at the very beginning of the book, and he said that Swamplandia is rolling right along until you get to the Deliverance-esque second half. 
and I would say that's very accurate. I was so stressed out for Ava and if you watch that reading vlog that I read this in, I was crying. I did not think this book was gonna make me cry. I just wanted her to be safe and happy and I wanted her sister to be safe. Like genuinely, I just wanted them all to be safe and it was so good and there's a lot to unpack there. So that was really, really great. Great way to start off the month. Really fantastic. So the next book that I read was Thirst. This is by Mariana um, Yuzuk. I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, but it's translated by Heather Cleary. And this is a gothic vampire novel. And it was so good. And I don't really think that you need to read this in the fall time. Like I feel like people think like vampire book and they're like, oh, I have to read that when it's kind of like Halloween ish time. You don't, it takes place in um, Buenos Aires. And so it's like very hot, like the climate um, weather wise. So if that is like a mood reading thing for you, don't let that worry you. But I do love this because this is so unlike any vampire book that I have read before and I do love a vampire book. You know, Twilight is legitimately the book series that made me fall in love with reading when I was in elementary school when all those books were coming out for the first time. I feel like I just aged myself but there it is. Anyway, so I have read a lot of vampire books in my day. I really, really enjoy them pretty much every single time. And something that was different about this book is the way that the story is told, you get the perspective of the vampire and then you also get the perspective of a human woman who is split in between two halves. So the first half of the book you get the vampire and then the second half you get the human woman. So life makes their paths cross essentially through means that I will not spoil here, but essentially it is kind of about thirst in general and hunger and wanting. You get it both in a metaphorical sense for the both of them. Um, our human character is basically really lost in her life right now. And then the vampire has um, gone through stages of her life where she has locked herself away and where she has been completely ravenous and like goes full into this kid and is just like, this is what I am. And the interesting thing was that the vampire character she never is regretful or remorseful about what she is i feel like when you think about the main vampire in a book typically what you get i mean think um our main character from the god of endings um and even more mainstream wise like stefan salvatore the cullens like if you think about it like that i feel like that has really put the narrative in a way where the vampire is very like I hate what I am. I hate that I can't be around you without wanting to kill you, blah, blah, blah. And this vampire is like, I love killing people. Like she's like, I love it and I want to do it more. And I love like drinking blood and like scaring people and this whole entire thing. Like she really relishes in it. And I really liked that perspective. Like she is not shy about her nature. Um, and the reason why she really goes into hiding isn't because of a moral sense it's because she doesn't know how to exist in this world without being caught and so there's a whole narrative between the two of them meeting the i do think that i gave this a three and a half and it would have been a four except for and i don't want this to i'm trying to think about if this is going to spoil anything the main plot point that it is marketed as does not happen for a very long time in the book. If I had gotten to see the two of them um, together and falling in love or falling into their relationship, however you want to classify it, I really would have loved it a lot more. But I loved the perspective of our vampire. I loved her story and I loved her like talking about it and talking about like when she was created and why she was created and then going to like present day like I really loved that journey that she took I thought that that was the most interesting part of the story and I thought the most interesting story was going to be their relationship but we just didn't get to see a whole lot of that but I do 
think that it was on purpose. Like I think that that was artistic license that the author chose to kind of, to kind of highlight the theme of time in the book about how um, you just like structurally how she wrote the book. It was, you could tell that this vampire had had so much time and she had been alive like forever. Time is not really measured in the book. The only way that we get the measurement of time is through her like recognizing technological advancements that we have seen. And then with our human, it's like Tuesday, next chapter, Thursday, next chapter, Friday, next chapter, like, and it's always like, I went home and then I made dinner and then I woke up. Like, it's very like, it's, oh my gosh, I have something in my eyeball. Anyway. Um, so it's just so interesting to see how the author did that. And I think it was very smart. So knowing that that was a literary device that the author chose, I'm not going to be too beat up about it. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So next we have His Majesty's Dragon by Naomi Novak. I gave this four and a half stars. I loved this book. I loved this. I am so excited to complete the series and to keep reading more. I have actually never, ever heard anything about this book series online, on like online anywhere, where whether it be YouTube, Instagram, I'm not really on TikTok much, but I definitely haven't heard about it there. I actually saw this when I was in Barnes and Noble and I did the video um, that was like, how many books can I grab in two minutes? And I saw these covers and I was like, oh my gosh. And I saw that Peter Jackson and Stephen King had pull quotes for it. And then I started doing research and everyone was like, this is what I wish fourth wing had been like. And I was like, say less, I'm signed up, I'm there. And the concept of this book is honestly, in my opinion, so original. Basically what we have is we have a ship captain and his name is William Lawrence. And we are actually set in our world. So this is when the Napoleon Wars were going on but it's our world, our earth, our like, you know, wars that are happening, except for there is dragons. And dragons are a very valuable resource in war because they can fly. Like they don't really talk about having like planes or anything. Like they talk about having ships. They talk about having um, like ground crews, like armies and stuff, but they never mention planes. And so these, like the dragons kind of take the place of like pilots, I guess. What is similar about this to Fourth Wing is that you have a branch of the military that pilot or pilots that flies, takes care of, nurtures these dragons, and they are involved in the war in that way. But after that, the endings kind of like the similarities kind of stop. Basically, what happens is we have um, our captain, Will Lawrence. He is a ship captain. He is a Navy man. He is uh, like really in love with his job. And they are British. And so His Majesty's Dragon, they fight for England and they commandeer a French ship that they discover has a dragon egg on it that went from Chile all the way to where they intercepted it. And so they take the dragon egg because I guess when you like are in the Navy and you commandeer a ship, you have the right to everything that's on the boat, I guess. And so their plan essentially is they draw straws to see who is going to join in the aerial corps because it is a very lonely life. Um, they normally don't get married. They never really see their family again because they have to take care of this dragon like apart from everyone. And so no one really wants to do it. Like no one on this ship is like, yeah, I'll do it, I'll volunteer. And so they draw straws. And essentially what it is though is that the dragon basically chooses you, like you don't choose the dragon. So even though Will didn't get chosen, to join the aerial corps and to take care of this dragon, our dragon chooses Will. So his name, um, Will names him Temraire, Temraire? I think it's Temraire. And he, uh, their relationship is honestly just the most heartwarming, magical little thing ever. I love how they love each other. Their bond is just, so amazing and sweet and I love it and I love him as a character and there's so many like underlying themes in the war and this book mainly takes place 
um, in the part of the story where they are training and getting on their feet with everything because Will has not ever trained to be an aerial core person. So he has no idea what's going on. He has no idea what to do. He has no idea rules and everything like that. And Temer is like, he just hatched out of his eggs. So he like doesn't even know anything that's happening. And so them finding each other and growing close to each other while they are trying to like figure out everything around them um, and like go into battle and all of that stuff is just very, very sweet and also really good. I think the writing flowed really well and I'm very excited for the next one. Next we have Euphoria by Lily King. This book was not necessarily a letdown because here's my problem. I'm a hopeless romantic so if I get in a synopsis that there's going to be a love triangle or a love story and it's not really shown that much like I'm going to be slightly disappointed. You know what I mean? I gave this a three and a half for that reason. Essentially what we have, which this is actually based on a true, I don't know if it's a true story, but it's actually based off of a real life anthropologist who was named Margaret Mead. We have her character, we have her husband, and they have basically just abruptly left the island that they were studying. So essentially with anthropologists at this time, I don't really know how it works now, but anthropologists at this time, they would kind of scout out and find a place that they wanted to study, a tribe that they wanted to study, and kind of um, acclimate themselves into the island and gain their trust and ask them all of these questions and see why they live the way they do and all of those things. And so they recently had to abruptly leave where they were because it wasn't safe um, for Nellie anymore essentially is what happened and they stop at a Christmas party that is hosted um, by another anthropologist in the area and at that party they meet our third character and our third character has been alone on his island for a very very long time and he is very very lonely and so he sees our other two characters at this party and basically befriends them because they're his age. Um, they have like, they all get along pretty quickly. He, the boys actually know each other. They went to school together. And so he basically just kind of latches onto them and is like, please come to my island. Please let me show you what I'm doing. Let me help relocate you. But in his head, he wants to relocate them closer so that he can have company essentially. And this book is all about um, possession and ownership and culture and we see our main man fall in love with the married woman and the married woman fall in love with him back. It's such an interesting slow paced love about how it happens and what happens. It's very smart. Um, we have our main girl Nellie she um, really, really wants to do her job and wants to do her job well. She wants to um, unlock the mysteries of these cultures that we don't know anything about. And she wants to um, do a lot of research and help the world to understand different ways of life. But her husband wants to like fully acclimate and become this other culture essentially. And so his point of view is very like, he doesn't really do a whole lot of research. Like he's an anthropologist, but he's like, just starts living like them. And um, his decisions and his actions really, really catapult and affect our other characters and take make this book take a different turn. And then our third one is similar. He's similar to Nellie in that he really just wants to do a good job. And um, their relationship was, it was one of those books where there was not necessarily a happy ending. But the last like three lines of the book, I was like, oh man, you're just like really taking my heart out right now. The only reason why it wasn't rated more is because it like, I just didn't see enough of that relationship. But what we, again, like thirst, I think that that was a, so, like, I think that was a conscious choice. Like, I don't think that it was an oversight. I think that it was like very intentional, if that makes any sense. So really enjoyed it. Really glad I read it, but not a favorite. Next, I read or I listened to Cultish by Amanda Montel. 
And this was so interesting. This book is essentially a um, nonfiction book all about cults and the language of cults and why cults form. And um, she goes into depth about a lot of different cults and basically how you can go from being a normal person um, with a normal brain. And she talks about like the concept of brainwashing and how they can convince other people to do the things that they want them to, how these cult leaders react when other people start to notice. Like it was very, very interesting. I thought that it was a great audiobook. I don't know that my attention would have been as kept if I was reading it because when I was listening to it, it just kind of felt like I was listening to a really interesting podcast. But I feel like reading wise, I might have gotten a little lost if that makes any sense. But for a audiobook, it was great. It was very, very interesting. If you're interested at all in like cults or like those type of documentaries, I think that it is a very good listen. And it was also just highlights, you know, like the victims of these cults, people who have escaped from them and how their lives are changed forever and how they have to like un like how they have to rewire the thinking patterns of their brain because they've been taught to think a certain way for a really long time. And I just thought that as a concept, it was just really fascinating and I really enjoyed it. Next, I finally finished the Kingdom of the Wicked series. I don't know what the series is actually called, but I did read Kingdom of the Feared. And I am so glad that I did. And it is so interesting to me how divisive this book series is. I normally don't really read YA. I um not like I'm like getting into it, but I think that sometimes it like scratches a good itch in my brain. And don't judge the covers. I 100% do, but don't. It's actually pretty good. It's hard to kind of describe what this book is about without spoiling things that happen in the other two books, but it's just so interesting to me how divisive this is and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. But, and basically I, I think I, I think this would be a whole, like as a whole, this is a four star series for me. Not the best thing that I've ever read, but I really enjoyed it. And I like, it gave me what I needed it to give me. And this book, I was really glad that it um, answered a lot of questions that I had because I thought that I was the problem reading it. I was like, the plot is lost. Like in my head, I was like, I'm just vibing. I don't even really know what's going on right now. Um, I was just like, wait, I thought that's what was important. No, wait, now this is important. I don't really know. But then in this book, you realize why you feel like that. Um, and it's because our main character has lost the plot. She don't know what's going on, but she finds out what's happening. And the romance in this book just was giving me everything that I needed. I love rap. I really do. But I don't really know if I really like Amelia, but I mean, she's cool. She's chill. Um, but I really liked Wrath and I really did like their relationship. And I do think that the concept was really good. And there is a trope in this book that I really, really enjoy reading that I didn't really realize until, well, I know I do realize it because it's also one of the themes in the OA, which is one of my favorite shows ever. I can't really say what the trope is though, because it's going to spoil the book. But if you know, you might know, um, but sorry to be so vague. It's really good. It was fun. I got through it really quickly and I'm glad that I'm now done with that series. So now I can go to Throne of the Fallen, which was the one that I was the most excited to read. Um, but I knew I didn't want anything to be spoiled for me. So I wanted to read this series first if I enjoyed it. So all over, I had a really great time and that's all that matters. So next I listened to another book on Spotify, A Horse at Night on Writing by Amina Kane. Now this book I actually um, found along with Cultish in another wrap up video that I'll put here that I really enjoy. I love all of her videos. And she basically said this was a great audiobook and I and it was good reflections on writing and books. And I said sign me up. Okay. So it really is a really good book. When I see on writing, I think of like Stephen King's on writing where it's like um kind of his journey as an author. But this book is really like a love letter to the craft of writing in general, of reading books. She talks about books and sentences and book titles and all of those things that she really loves 
and it's really just an ode to reading and writing in general and the craft and I think that it was a really good um, quick read um, it's only two hours long on Spotify so I think that if you're trying to meet your end of the year goal or your monthly goal for reading I think this would be a good quick one to listen to it is um, entertaining in a different way um, it's not like plot wise obviously but it is very entertaining and this book really inspired me to read not that I need much inspiration to read but it was very like oh my gosh I do love reading like I do love books authors are so amazing and talented and all of that stuff it just really made you appreciate it as a craft a lot more and next we I read Real Americans by Rachel Kong I gave this I want to say a four and a half this was our book club book that I lead at a bookstore and the conversations surrounding this book are so interesting because there is so much to unpack there's so many plot points so many literary devices so many metaphors so much everything that the conversation was just really really great and I will say there is a lot going on but not in a bad way where you feel overwhelmed and where you're like this is really trying to do too much it was um just a really great interesting intriguing read we essentially have our book that is split into three parts so our first part is our main character Lily and she falls in love with a man named Matthew and Lily is a Chinese American who was born in America and her parents immigrated from China. So um, she grew up and she was um, didn't have a whole lot of money and she falls in love with Matthew who is like this um, like heir to this vast vast pharmaceutical fortune essentially. And so despite all their differences they fall in love and it is just really really great and they have a child and his name is Nick and our second part of the book is um, from Nick's perspective and he does not know who his dad is he does not even know his name he has never met him his mom won't talk about him nothing and so you're kind of trying to figure out like where the disconnect is because Lily and Matthew were so in love so it's like how do you get from point A to point B and then we have our third character who is May who is Lily's mother and she from her perspective you're kind of saying like why did Lily like cut me off because Lily also does not talk to her mom at this point either and so it's the mom's perspective of trying to escape from communist China and basically how her decisions led her to the effect of her daughter not talking to her anymore and there is such an interesting plot twist in here that I did not really see coming and one of the main um, questions of this book is are we born or are we made and if so who gets to do the making so it's kind of like what does a real American mean um, do we get to choose who we are are we is it chosen for us is everything predestined or do we shape our own lives can we shape our own lives and if so who gets to do it is it me is it the people around me um, it was very very interesting I think that it is going to be on a lot of literary prize nominations um, I definitely am calling it right now that it's gonna be nominated for the women's prize for fiction I'm calling it and it was so fantastic it was really good um there's so many themes in it that you really just have to experience for yourself essentially and our last book is one that i have been avoiding since february and that is magnolia parks into the dark now here was my journey with this book and i feel like i need to explain myself a little bit i love I, I love Magnolia Parks I love that entire series um I love Julian Hayes I would genuinely ruin my life for him I think that he is so fantastic <laughs> all, anyway if you know you know all of that to say this is a five-star series for me it has not trying to be dramatic but it has altered my brain chemistry and the reason why I've been avoiding it because you would hear all of those things and you would be like well Rachel if you love it so much then why did you not read it immediately when it came out in February and here's what happened okay I ordered this from Blackwell's so that I could get the UK cover because that's the only way that you can get these original covers it was a whole thing when that was announced 
and I don't have any of the other covers so I didn't want to go to Barnes and get the new ones which I do want to own but I didn't want to just have this one essentially because I'm a freak and so my order was delayed so I did not get this book until about two weeks after it came out and so it was all that I was seeing on like reading vlogs on YouTube and Goodreads reviews and YouTube wrap ups and all of those things. And the way that people were describing this book kind of made me feel like I could tell exactly what was going to happen. Um, and that really made me feel like, do I even need to read it? But I was going to because I love them so much. So I had to. But it really just kind of made me feel like I could tell what was going to happen and I didn't like that because normally with every other book in this series you're like what is going to happen and no one says anything because there's a lot of um, like plot points that can be spoiled but this one everyone was kind of like laying out the structure of the book and it kind of made me feel like I already could tell what was going to happen. And in the middle of that, I got it delivered. I was filming a 24 hour reading vlog, which was is the last 24 hour reading vlog I have filmed. It's been so long. It's been so long um, because that day really put me into a slump. So I was reading that book. I got put into a book slump. And so I set it down and did not pick it up again until a few days ago. And I am so glad that I did. And I really wish that I had done it sooner. I really wish that I had not let what other people were saying about it make me think that I knew what was going to happen because honestly, I didn't without saying too much like the main factor of this book are things that have happened in previous books. And without spoiling too much, poor BJ is out here fighting for his life. Everyone is just kind of expecting the worst out of him and he has really turned it around. I would say what's interesting for me is that long way home, BJ is really um, working on himself and going through therapy. And then in this book, he is really trying to be the best human that he can be. And Magnolia is the one that finally needs to come to terms with things that have happened to her her entire life and that was really great because this relationship is not going to work unless the both of them work on themselves individually and try to figure themselves out but here we have the culmination of all of that you have um, magnolia going through very very intense grief um, with something that happened in the long way home and you have her working through that you also have her working through all of her past relationship trauma that has happened with bj with her past in general family aspects of it and seeing them work through everything together was just so sweet and great and i love them and i am going to miss them so much <laughs> like i am really gonna miss them so much i was so sad like the last like 100 pages, I was like, I really don't want this to be over. Like I'm genuinely so sad. And I know we're going to see glimpses of them in the next Daisy Hates books, but I still was just like, I am just so like, I'm happy for them. <laughs> like I'm so happy for them, but I'm like, no, like <laughs> don't leave me, you know, um, which is so crazy. I'm like really just need y'all to know that I like am aware that I am talking about these people and grieving over not seeing them anymore like they're real. Like I am very aware of how psychotic that sounds, but that's just how that book series makes me feel like I'm fully convinced that these are real people. Like if I go to London and I'm walking around, I'm going to see them and, you know, see them in the tabloids and all that crap. Like it's so ridiculous. Um, so anyway, if you haven't read that series yet, I highly encourage you to, but that was a uh, oh, five star <laughs> if I didn't say that. This reading month was really good. I am pretty excited about next month. I don't have as much planned out. Um, my mom picked out my TBR for me. Um, I'm very interested to see how much of it I actually read. Her methods were so interesting, um, but it was really fun to have her in the video and I'm very interested to see, um, what I end up doing with what she chose for me essentially is what we can say. I hope you guys have had a great month of May and I hope June is really great for you and I will see you guys later.